I am Viviane Ducey, and I've been with uh, Seeker for about the, the full two and a half years since its inception. And um, I'm on the steering committee, and I've been helping out on some of the administration for Seeker, as you probably some of you will know. So I think that's really it from a, from a big team who's been responsible for this meeting. Thank you very much. And also fantastic to have so many people online on a Saturday morning. Uh, and I think the bad weather, or at least the grey weather, is helping most of us to, to be prepared and willing to be in front of our computers this morning. So very welcome and have a good day today. Thank you. I think, Nicola, it's over to you then. You and Kay. Hello, hello. Hello, I've, I've, lo I've lost my, my side act, my double act, my sidekick. Where's she going? I can't do it without her. Uh, We've got a... <laughs> <laughs> so hello delivery man hello okay hello hello um <laughs> so how did it get started uh over to you carrie no it's over to you no 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 you start. no no <laughs> no no go on. no no it's you no you come on you've Is got your me? notes all right yeah, sorry start. okay all right how did it all begin well nicola and i periodically catch up we catch up for a cuppa and a chat and to put the world to rights and uh just before christmas in 2018 we decided to go and sit with nature at Pulver Brooks, didn't we? We did. And, uh, and hatch a plan. Um, and we both are very involved with lots of wonderful, amazing climate activists, and most of them are in the room today. And we thought, come on, how can we work better together? Um, why are we all working in these little silos? And so we thought, actually, World SOS Day is coming up in February. Let's get them all together. So we booked three venues. We started at the library in Horsham and we outgrew that within days. Um, within a few days of appealing to our friends here today, uh, we had nine speakers. Um, and then, we, yeah, we outgrew the library. Then we decided, oh, we'll go to our Horsham Quaker friends. And they said, yes, use our wonderful hall. Uh, we outgrew that in a couple more days, didn't we? <laughs> and then Nicola said, well, how about the Unitarian Church? So they're all very close together. If people went to the wrong venue, <laughs> we would signpost them uh, to the right venue. So um, we ended up with uh, 14 um, speakers from 11 towns, three wonderful young 10, 11 year olds who stepped up within days to speak on behalf of young people because we were determined there was going to be someone, uh, young people there. Um, we all piled into the Unitarian Church uh, we overflowed into the balcony. Uh, we were, I'm sure, beyond the uh, fire limits. I've got, to, I've got to wrap you up now because I've got to say yeah, something. Right. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so basically, yes, we, I mean, my, I've been over the years for many transition town groups and, and climate action groups that um, had been asking me to go and speak. And it always felt the same thing. It was the same small group of people and these small groups never grew. It was always the same people taking action. And it just really felt that actually we need to take this to another level. And we may need to make all these little groups feel like they're a part of something bigger. And, you know, I work a lot with the mycelium and the network below the ground. And it's like, that's what we have to be. We have to create a network where we join the people in our bioregion. We could have just started off and said, let's just be Sussex based. But it's like, well, that's limiting it why not allow ourselves to grow? And so by saying that, you know, we would look at the Southeast, it was enabling us to, you know, move our bioregion to really the area where we live. So that was really, you know, how we had this, this vision and this idea to um, actually kind of like start Seeker and, um, and then really where it's gone from that seed that we planted of saying, let's bring these organizations together, let's create an alliance and since then, I've been asked to speak in the Southwest, they want to start an alliance and North Wales also want to start an alliance. So that's really what we're doing is, you know, we're creating models and, um, and from there it has grown on. And so over to you, Jeff, who will tell us now where SEEK has gone from those humble beginnings um, to where we are now. Well, thank you so much, you two, for planting that seed. It's, um... Seed planting has rarely been so successful in my experience. This has been one of the most exciting things I've been part of in a, in a long career. Um, let me just share my screen now. Um, 
So is that is that okay? Can you see that? Um, I was um, I thought it'd be useful because quite a few people on the on the call are relatively new to Seeker to give you a bit of a run through of kind of how we got started and um, you know the story so far. So this was that meeting that um, that um, Carrie and Nicola were talking about, and it was as you can see the room was packed, and we there was it was very organic. There wasn't any kind of pre plan on um, what should come out of this, which was actually very refreshing. And different people were raising different, well, they're describing what they were doing. Um, but we came along with a bit of an idea and um, we kind of shared the idea that, that we'd been brewing in Stenning, with Greening Stenning. And a few of us, um, you know, shared the thought of, we're thinking of getting a campaign going around getting our councils to, to declare a climate emergency. We were so frustrated at that time um, that nothing was happening, that we thought this um, brand new climate emergency movement could give us some real um, um, kind of power to have impact. And we floated that to the group, who'd like to join us on this? And to our amazement and delight, pretty well every hand in the room went up. And um, within about two weeks, um, we had a, an organ, we'd chosen a name, we'd nicked the logo for, from the National Climate Emergency Group, and we had a website and we got going. Um, and this is how we've grown. So um, as you can see, we're up to 116 members. And on the right, you can see the breakdown of different kinds of groups. And it's a very nice diverse group from, you know, from, from faith groups, repair cafes, up to some national organizations. And the, the, um, the, the networks like Transition, Friends of the Earth and XR are very well representative, represented. But it's a diverse group, which I think is a real source of strength. This is where we're now based. And you'll see it's, it's actually quite wide across the southeast by now. In the beginning, it was clustered around, around Horsham for obvious reasons and the neighbouring parts of Surrey. But we've had a big growth in interest from Kent, East Sussex and Hampshire in the last year, which is really great. So we hit the ground running. Remember that, that meeting was in early February. Well, it, it was within about two weeks that um, we had actually we were outside the county hall in Chichester campaigning for their for a divestment vote, and this was a great example of, of strength in numbers because Worthing Climate Action were planning something, and they said, "Who would like to come with us and help?" And rather than being ten people, we had fifty people there, and that was the beginning of actually making an impression in West Sussex. This was a few weeks later, um, a few months later in Horsham, where the same, um, the same approach worked. And luckily that year was a local election year. And we, we had the idea that we could use this as a leverage point. So this was our very first pledge campaign. And um, out of the 43 people who signed a pledge, 16 got elected, which we thought was really impressive. Um, and to our absolute amazement, the climate emergency movement took off. So this is a graph of how many councils in the southeast have either passed a motion um, or declared climate emergency in green or passed a reasonably significant climate motion. And to our, frankly, to our amazement, by January 2020, every single council in the region had done so. Now, we obviously can't claim all the credit for this because lots was happening, you know, um, Greta was happening, XR was happening, um, loads of things were happening, but I think we can safely say we really helped give this whole thing a nudge. So by the end of the year, it, the question arose really, is that job done? Is, is this, is Seeker's job now over? Well, needless to say, the, we didn't think so. We met up in January 2020, this was our first networking meeting, You'll notice the kind of slightly bizarre lack of masks on people's faces there. I can't even remember how that used to work, but we had a really wonderful kind of, um, um, it was kind of inspiring event, bringing all this talent, all this energy together in, in, um, in, in person um, in, in Horsham. And we're trying to recreate that um, today, but maybe next year's event will be back and be able to do it in person, let's hope so. And we talked there about what should, where should we go from here? And a number of ideas were mooted. Some possibilities of some little sub networks on different themes came out of the woodwork. They didn't, um, didn't in, in fact go anywhere at the time, partly because of COVID, I'm sure. 
But the thing that we did agree on is that we needed to keep pressing for climate actions. So this kind of original focus on councils seemed to be an important niche. So in the year after that, we've been concentrating on developing our relationships with councils, in some cases working as kind of critical friends um, rather than banging on the door from the outside, a bit of a shift in our, in our kind of mode. But we've been doing a lot to try and share good practice and stir the pot. And we've also been keeping tabs on them. And uh, Sally and Alison have been doing sterling work on the Seeker Climate Survey, which if you've not seen, you need to take a peek at, because this is the best available source at the moment to show what every council in the area is doing. And coming into this year, it was once again, local election time. So we, we re-designed re, um, the pledge idea to the ABCD pledge, which most of you will know. And lo and behold, we got 331 pledges this time and 64 candidates elected. So that compares to 16 out of 43 last time round. So you can see how far we've got. Um, and the good news here is that we now have at least 64 kind of potential champions um, with, within these various councils across the region who we can, we can work with, we can follow up. So I think this, this pledging approach has really helped us open those doors. Now, I'm, I'm going to share a few words on how we're governed because some of you may be under the impression that um, we, we are a strong, well-funded organisation with, with an office and a, a large team of people ready to jump when, when anybody says jump. If, if, that, if, if so, then the illusion has worked because, in fact, the reality is very different. We are extremely light touch. We don't have a bank account or formal constitution. Um, the way we work is through a steering group, which is um, anybody is well, very welcome to come along. And um, I think at the moment there's about 30 or 40 get invitations and usually 20 or 25 come to most meetings. Above all, we're a coalition of like-minded groups just trying to make a difference and trying to figure out how we, by working together, we can actually really boost all of our efforts. But the thing which is important to recognize is it only works because a handful of people are taking the lead and doing all the work. And you'll probably recognize most of those people today because they're the ones giving presentations, facilitating groups. And um, um, you know, there's a, there's a core group who've been putting a lot of time into this. Um, and this is something we need to kind of work on to make this sustainable. But what have we learned? We've been going for two and a half years and this, um, I shared this slide uh, a year and a half ago and I think it's even more true now. First of all, strength in numbers is crucial. Um, we've really shown that. We've, we've been able to look much bigger than we really are by bringing together this alliance. And I think another thing that's helped is we've focused on a few achievable goals rather than trying to do everything. Um, I think it would have been easy to have tried to do everything and not done very much. But we seem to be adding value at the moment, um, filling a spot. We, we're not necessarily going to fill the same spot forever, but um, there's a, we need to be quite thoughtful, I think, about what is the role we're playing, what are we doing which is different from others. Um, but it certainly helps us all to feel part of something bigger. Um, the information role, I think, is appreciated. That's something I spend my time on but we've succeeded in looking bigger than we really are. Now, a couple more points. I think our non-party party political stance has, has helped. So we're welcomed in councils of all colors. Um, we've done a lot in a short time, but I think the big message from those of us at the center, this is hard work if we're gonna grow this. So we need to share that load better. So kind of a subject for the next few months, not just today, is where should we go from here? Um, and um, we certainly need more followers, but to go somewhere interesting, above all, we need more leaders and more doers. And those of you in the room, I think are our primary talent pool for this. And I know you're really busy with all the things you're already doing, but if you like the look of Seeker and you've got ideas, we wanna hear from you. Um, so the way to do that is our next steering group is on the, on the 19th. And if you'd like to play a role in shaping the future, come along.
Um, there'll be details of, of, of um, how to take part um, following later, but thanks very much. I hope that helps. So thank you, Jeff. And Tony now is going to be giving us a little bit of a kind of setting the scene as to what is coming next. So over to you, Tony. Great, thanks very much indeed. And uh, thanks, Jeff, for that introduction. What I'm going to do now is a uh, uh, probably five or six minutes, I hope, and leave a little bit of a time for calm afterwards. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the point of the day to start with. Uh, why are we all here? Well, I mean, picking up what we've already heard, I think uh, the next stage now is to raise the temperature, raise the expectation, because we need to make a big stepwise change. I, the point I want to make is that baby steps are no longer an option. We've seen that we've seen we've all seen the statistics. We all know what's happening, so we need to make a big stepwise change. So how do we do that in a small group like this? Well, I think we're going to, it's fairly high risk, we're going to try and do something which is fairly emergent, fairly organic. And what I want to do for the rest, what we'd like to do for the rest of the session is to try and encourage nuggets of inspiration from all of you, not just one or two of us, but all of us. We're all going to try and find those nuggets of inspiration to springboard forward. But actually what I thought I'd do to start with is, is to review where we are in the great scheme of things. So if I can share my screen, give me a second. Um, you all know this stuff, and I know I know that, but I think it still bears retelling. Um, where, I, where actually are we when it comes to the climate emergency? Well, you know this graph, this is the Keeling curve, this is the gradual increase of carbon dioxide over the years, yet familiar stuff. The point I want to make though is actually even as environmentalists, do we really get it? Do we really get the scale and the, and the, and the intensity of the emergency? Do we really get where we actually are in, on this graph? Uh, we, we know about this increase before, before uh, the industrial revolution, 280 parts per million, now it's heading to 420, 50% increase, we know about that. We know we've tried all sorts of things to actually address that problem. So we know we know things have been going on. And yes, of course, there's a lot has been going on. And look at this just for when it comes to various conventions and climate uh, conferences, uh, particularly the UN Convention on Climate Change there, roughly about 1992. Yeah, so a lot's going on, but still that curve goes up without the slightest dent, the slightest downturn. And I want to give you a really shocking statistic. I mean, looking at that, that's bad enough. 1992-ish, we all signed the climate uh, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. We were going to solve climate change. That's when the COPs started, the Conference of Parties. Uh, that's when they started. There were going to be plans to address climate change. What happened? Since 1992, uh, about half the carbon dioxide that's ever been emitted has been emitted. Think about that. Since 1992, we've emitted more carbon dioxide than the entire history of the human race before 1992. That is the way exponential growth works, and there's not the slightest dent in that coming down. Now that's that's shocking. We've, we're now almost committed to one and a half degrees of, of, of uh, temperature rise, which will bring major changes, and it's likely to be much, much more. So you know, this is this is something we, we really need to consider. You know, things are not slowing down. Let's put this into a bigger context. And again, I think most of you have probably seen these sorts of graphs, but I, I think it, it's salutary to look at this. Uh, roughly, we've been around for roughly 200,000 years. This is a compressed scale, as I'm sure you'll see. So we've been around for 200,000 years as a species, about a million years as a, as a genus, as a family of species. Uh, but look at this graph. Uh, the temperature um, range uh, for about the first, well, nearly 800,000 years has been all over the place. Temperature and climate has been very, very variable until we get to the Holocene period, which we are living in. We are living in a 10,000 year period of really unusual uh, climate stability. Seasons have been predictable, the, the weather has over, overall been benign, and only in the last 10 to 12,000 years has that period been, been like that. And only in that period has it been possible to develop agriculture and to develop civilization. Before that, 200,000 years ago, we were no different. We were just as bright as we are now, but only in the last 10,000 years have we developed agriculture and civilization. We are bringing that period to an end. Look at that graph at the end there. That's in Fahrenheit, so the figures are bigger than you think that you're, than you're used to. But you can see the trajectory. We are bringing to an end a stable period in the Earth's climate on which we rely totally. So that's a bit of a shock. And this is happening in the very quick future. 
Now, th these are the so-called mitigation curves. You've seen the graph of carbon dioxide increase. This is the graph we now need to achieve to get the decrease. Um, we're roughly following the black line at the moment, or should be following the black line at the moment. This is how fast we're going to have to reduce our, our emissions in order to get to where we need to be to stand a chance, only a 66% chance of keeping below one and a half degrees centigrade, a two thirds chance of staying below uh, one and a half degrees centigrade. I just think about that, you know, would you get on an aeroplane if you thought there was only a 66% chance of it getting to, to its destination? However, we think this is optimistic. So there we are, we're following that black line and this is how fast we're gonna to have, to have, to have to reduce our carbon emissions. Look at, look at the past there. If we'd have started when we said we would, back in 1992, we could have reduced uh, emissions by about three or 4% a year. It would have been quite manageable. We could have transitioned slowly. Today, we're gonna to have to do it at about 10% a year. Um, just to put that into perspective, uh, last year, with all the COVID restrictions, uh, we only achieved a 7% reduction. And as you all know, that's rebounded massively. So we've now had one of the biggest increases in carbon dioxide ever. So we're not achieving this even in a pandemic. Now let's, you know, this is a, um, a, a peer reviewed graph. I put my own interpretation on this. So this is my own kind of crayoning over to put it into perspective. I believe up until about 2015, which is a salutary date, that's in the Paris Agreement, we had the chance to transition. We could have managed a transition to a low uh, carbon future. We have passed that period. We're now in a, in a period where we're looking at disruption. The changes are gonna have to be disruptive. Now, I mean that in a technical sense, we're looking for disrupt disruptive te technologies, which are gonna change things quickly. We can't do baby steps anymore. So we're looking at disruptive change. And if we don't achieve that literally within the next 10 years, we're looking at catastrophic levels of change. 50% reductions in one year, for example. How do we do that? And this is the standard chance of hitting one and a half degrees. Uh, the result of this is probably that we're not going to hit one and a half degrees. We're probably locked into at least two, which is a major, major problem. Now, I thought you know, I put that in. You all know this stuff, I'm sure. But I think it bears retelling because I think we really have to grasp the way this graph is compressing in front of us. We're running out of time. And in my view, we're going to spend less time talking about climate change as we go through this and more time talking about how we build resilience to the to changes we've actually committed ourselves to, like it or not. And I think as one of the, um, one of the uh, top climate scientists in the world said, looking at these sorts of things and looking at where the future is, there are no, no non-radical futures left. The most radical future will be if we try to do nothing, because then we are, there'll be the, the biggest radical change. So there are no non-radical futures left. Okay, um, I shall stop share now. Um, as I said, you know, you know this, we've all, we're all familiar with these graphs, but I really wanted to say that again, because we, we do really need to get this in order to, to raise our game, raise our expectation, demand more. We need to imagine more, we need to demand more, and we, yes, of course, we need to do more. But we can't just sit on our laurels thinking, great, we've done, so, we've done well so far, we'll do a little bit more. No, we're going to have to look for stepwise change, moving into a bigger category. How are we going to achieve that? We need to up our game entirely to fight climate change and look, look towards uh, resilience. So I, sh I, shall, I shall leave it at that. Um, it's a bit of a kind of um, heavy hitting uh, approach, but I think we need to have that background in order to work out where we're going to go in the future. And I think what I'll do now is to hand back to Nicola and Carrie, who are going to calm us down a bit so we can move to the next bit and think about how we actually make use of some of this. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So, you know, how do we assimilate information like that? I mean, so much is coming at us and we can just go through this sense of, of overwhelm. And many, many years ago, I went to the O2 and I heard the Dalai Lama speak, sold out audience. And his, the moral of the story, what he said, which I took from there, he said, the busier that we are, the more we need to meditate because we need the space between the noise because otherwise it's just noise, it's just information. So I'd like us to just have one minute where we can just have a moment of mindfulness, these gaps, these spaces. So if I just encourage you all now to just feel your feet on the ground and I want just one minute, we're gonna close our eyes. So let's just be sitting comfortably, eyes closed, feet on the floor. 
and just take a deep breath. And just remembering why we are all here and why we do what we do. If we feel our feet on the floor connected down into the earth, the soil beneath us that provides our food, the water, the rains, the rivers. Imagine the water flowing clear and pure. The air, taking a breath of clean air. And the fire, the sun. These elements are that which we cannot live without and that we have chosen to be of service to, to create balance on this earth at this time. So just taking this moment just brings us round to just being here and being now. So we just open our eyes again and we're gonna be moving on now to Jay. So it just gives us a moment to say pause in between this information. So Jay is going to show us what we've learned from the Citizens Assembly. And, and it was a great honor that I spoke at the Citizens Assembly about climate justice for the Worthing and Ada Council. And there's been other Citizens Assemblies going on. And, um, and so Jay, you know, over to you. Hello everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, Seeker networking meeting. And um, I've been a member of the Seeker Steering Group since the beginning, um, as I'm part of uh, Kind of Living, which uh, runs a sustainability home show in the Horsham area every year, we hope, except during COVID, amongst many other things. Uh, what's my locus for doing this uh, slot? Well, my professional career has been as a director in local government. And um, also in May, having retired, um, I was elected to West Sussex County Council. And in that context, I'd like to start with Martin Sheen's words. Future generations are not going to ask us what political party were you in when you knew the glaciers were melting. So just to reflect on that, that's why I've, I always have strongly supported Seeker's non-partisan approach to this. But the thing is, democratic governments can only do in, in most circumstances, what they have the consent of the people to do. And people will accept all sorts of things and all sorts of changes in times of crisis. So if you think back, conscription in times of war, rationing, blackouts, and even lockdowns and compulsory health testing in the circumstances we're in now. And what, what do we mean by crisis in, those, in that context? Well, I think what we mean is people are visibly dying. People are hearing about their friends, their relatives, their neighbours there, and they know that there is a threat to life. And our problem is that in climate terms, by the time people are visibly dying, it's too late. In most cases, I appreciate there are others in low-lying islands in the Pacific who would argue with that, but from our perspective, that's actually the situation. And those carbons take 200 years to disperse. So just adding to what Tony said, you know, that, that's part of our problem about consent. So where are we now in terms of popular support for climate action? So I want to start, first of all, with worldwide. Um, we can look at the UN Development Programme's People's Climate Vote during 2020. This covered 50 countries and, and involved, you know, sampling of about half the world's population. So it's a huge um, indicator of how uh, the world is thinking about this. And there's good news, which is 64% think that climate change is a global emergency. And there are major majorities in some of the highest emitting countries for more renewable energy, changed land use and forest conservation, more use of electric vehicles or bicycles. And there's a high correlation of this support with those who have college or university levels of education. And funnily enough, 
uh, high correlation between the younger, the younger members of the population, and by that I mean the 18 to 59s, who are more concerned than the 60 pluses. So it's, it's well worth a read. Um, obviously, uh, it's a pretty detailed document. It's on the UN Development Programme's website, and I'm sure we can make that link available. But what about here in the UK? Well, um, as you will know, um, the UK has led in terms of par Parliament declaring a climate emergency, and six select committees of the UK Parliament set up the Climate Assembly UK. And this was to review how the UK can achieve its legally binding target of zero emissions by 2050. Yes, I, I know, uh, we'll see whether that stays after COP26, but that was where they were at the time. And they had a carefully balanced selection of 108 people. They had six weekends of input from the right experts during 2020. Um, if you go on the website, some of those inputs are really powerful and, and they give you a whole load of background information that, that I found really helpful. <clears throat> and they deliberated. So, um, you know, what can we do about this? I'm going to give you some shorthand, uh, a shorthand review, let's call it, because it's a obviously relatively short uh, time we have now of what they recommended. So what they said about land travel, uh, that they, these are the, the our peers, um, a representation of our population. Uh, they wanted a ban on sale of new petrol, diesel and hybrids vehicles by 2030, uh, with grants to help low carbon cars and a scrappage scheme and reduction in car use. They were looking for um, bringing public transport under government control. Interesting in the light of the recent uh, issues around uh, the train franchises to allow for sustainable investment in new clean vehicles uh, new routes, greater frequency and lower fares. And they also wanted better planning of local communities, an interesting point this, to facilitate reduced travel, essentially by making sure that there were local facilities so you didn't have to go elsewhere, and that sc scooter and cycle use was encouraged. Um, what did they say about air travel? Interesting, this was the one that they seemed to find most difficult to look at more radical solutions. They were, they were worried about the impact on people's lifestyles, but they recommended tax increases for the more frequent and long mileage flyers. Uh, they looked at um, uh, reducing the, the growth in passenger numbers. They didn't want the previous projections pre-COVID. They definitely wanted the polluters to pay the airline industry to invest in greenhouse gas removal and the development of new sustainable flight technologies. And they, um, <laughs> they still leave 30 million tonnes of CO2 uh, still to be removed or prevented. Uh, in the home, they wanted a more long term government strategy, which was around much better information, help and support. Um, they looked at greater competition in the sustainable energy production. They looked at product standard changes towards low carbon products and they wanted gas boilers banned uh, you know, from sale by 2030. On food production and land use they were very keen on natural outcomes. Information and training for land users, um, regulations about low carbon and subsidies for carbon storage and absorption and also using government procurement of low carbon food and low carbon products. And they, they were looking at a reduction in meat and dairy consumption by 20 to 40%. There's much, much more in this report and I don't have time to really go through the, the whole of the rest of it. But um, the key thing is that many of these recommendations are about what people will accept. I suggest to you that you go and have a look at it, you go and have a read of it, and um, I want to finish by saying I think COP26, with the uh, curves that Tony has shown us, is going to help move uh, public opinion on in terms of what we need to do to radicalise
the work we have to do. And I'm going to finish with a quote. Start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. That was St Francis of Assisi. I'm sorry, I couldn't get through the whole of that in the time available. Please go and have a look at the report yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. And maybe you could put the link to that in the chat as well. So over to you, Sally, who is going to talk to us about how ambitious are the councils and what she's learned from her great survey she's been working on. So over to you, Sally. Okay, thanks, Nicola. Um, so I'm Sally Barnard and I'm the main seeker coordinator and I've been involved in this seeker council survey. I'll just share my screen. Uh, here we go. Hold on. So um, Francesca and I are going to have a look at step change in our local councils. How are our councils doing? What would step change actually look like and what's needed to make it happen? Um, I'm going to take a quick look from a public viewpoint and Francesca will look at it from a council view. So there's a quick snapshot of the Seeker survey and you can find that on the council page on our website. I think we've put a link up already. Um, it looks at all the councils in the Seeker area and it's mainly what can be found from their websites plus other feedback we've had. These are some of the issues that it covers. I'll quickly buzz through this, but have a look. Um, and it mainly just gives you a broad feel for what's going on. It's, it's quite an informal survey. So how do things look? Here's a chart. This shows you the, um, whether councils have published a climate action plan yet. And actually, this is quite, this is good news. This is looking at action plans for council operations. Um, and as you can see, nearly every council has now produced an action plan for their own operations. And most are aiming for 2030. But as you know, that's the easy bit. Here's the tough bit. This is the number of councils who've produced action plans for their whole area. Um, that's 98% of the emissions and that's a huge task and a lot of it as you know is outside the direct control of the council but there has been progress with this and more and more councils are recognising some responsibility for leading on it um, but in my view step change would look like this that it would mean the government actually giving councils a duty to take the lead on their area-wide emissions and aiming for the new UK target at least of 78% reduction by 2035. Moving on, here's some data about council websites. Um, on the left is whether um, councils actually mention climate on their homepage and on the right is, is there a climate page of any sort? And that's progress in the last six months. So you can see both of those are going up. So there is steady progress. So I'll just go back to home pages. Here's an example of what a lot of home pages look like at the moment. Um, all about coronavirus and co communication teams have been hard at work with coronavirus. Here's a step change. Surrey Heath, that's their home page. What can you do to help tackle climate change right on their home page? More on websites. There'd be clear information about how to get involved, actions residents can take. This is Planet Woking, which is an initiative from Woking Borough Council, worth a look. Um, climate action plans would be very clear and residents would see, their, see how they fit into it. Um, this is the one from Basingstoke and Dean, but there are examples out there um, which do this very well. There'd be regular reporting back to residents on progress on emissions reduction. Uh, this is from Gresham Council. They're, they've done an annual report, which is really well represented. And we know all this. There'd be lots of community engagement from the council. 
um, climate assemblies, conferences, working with us um, to get projects going, enabling local projects. Here's a great example of a newsletter. This, this is from Francesca's team, uh, Ada and Worthing, uh, which really makes you feel involved when you read it. Um, an example of community engagement from Eastbourne. This is the Eco Action Network that's supported by the Borough Council. And we all know this, we would see council pension funds divested, big projects would be starting to come online, heat networks, solar arrays, planning decisions would make climate sense um, to the public about around new builds, roads, airport expansion. And climate action would flow and be enabled at every level. That's what I would like to see from government, to local authorities, to communities. But at the moment, councils, it feels like they're having to work against the flow. And I think Francesca is going to talk some more about this. There's been two recent reports come out that we'll put some links up to, which um, give I give their thoughts on what councils actually need to make um, for this flow to happen. So these are really worth a look. So I'd say we need to get behind our local councils and push for government to give them help with this. Thanks very much. Are you handing straight over to Francesca? I see you're doing a double act, you two there. So Francesca, are you around? You're going to um, tell us directly a little bit words from the council. Yeah, thank you. Can you can you see that? OK, I've put a slide up. Fantastic. OK, well, it's really lovely to be invited by Seeker. We've achieved so much to push climate action forward regionally. So thank you. I'm Francesca Eiliff. I'm the Strategic Sustainability Manager at Ada and Worthing Councils. And we've been developing really ambitious work on this um, agenda. But we recognise the importance of local leadership to deliver climate action. I'm going to base my talk on the Committee on Climate Change work around the sixth carbon budget, for which they've developed a really great report called Local Authorities and the Sixth Carbon Budget. And this makes recommendations to local authorities, but also to government to enable local authorities to do more towards net zero. And I think this combined approach is really vital. It can't be one or the other, it has to be both. So I hope this helps with your discussions around climate, um, step change towards net zero. Oh, just trying to move my slide on. There we go. So the sixth carbon budget presents um, an immense scale of transformation that's needed. Um, it describes a steeper downward curve to carbon reduction than we've ever seen before. And the CCC calculate that local authorities have some influence over so many sectors that local action um, could deliver nearly half our national emissions reductions. So this chart shows how councils can control um, or influence emissions through their wide ranging services and functions. And it starts um, at the top little um, blue circle with um, emissions in direct control of councils, which are for their buildings, operations and travel. But these actually account for less than 5% of the area-wide emissions. And it's slightly more for counties and unitary authorities that control highways and waste disposal, but much less for districts and boroughs like Adrian Worthing. Um, we have um, less than 1% of our emissions direct from um, the council. Um, it's less than 1% of the area-wide emissions. Secondly, the dark blue ring is emissions from procurement and commissioning, which we can control. Many decisions council make are on long-term contracts that last for decades, like waste. Um, and these can lock in emissions for the long term, 
all of these investments need to be completely net zero by 2030, preferably sooner, of course. Um, thirdly, is through place shaping, using the powers of planning, and for those that are also highways authorities, transport powers. Again, decisions made now have the power to lock in emissions into the future, but planning authorities have very limited powers to require net zero development. And furthermore, nationally set housing targets work against the net zero agenda um, and show us a really fragmented national approach. Fourth is through showcasing, innovating and piloting and demonstrating good practice that shows scalable, replicable solutions for others to adopt. So, for example, Worthing Borough Council is developing plans for a net zero heat network that other large organisations can connect to, to facilitate heat decarbonisation at scale. Fifthly, councils can influence through partnerships, through leading and bringing together organisations and joining other partnerships. And a great example of this is the work of West Sussex County Council, who are delivering the first national county-wide net zero electric vehicle charging network. And lastly, but crucially, through engagement and communication, to bring local residents and businesses on board with their huge purchasing power and ability to deliver decarbonisation through behaviour change. So Adrian Worthing made a start on this by holding a climate assembly and working with Transition Town Worthing and Worthing Climate Action Network to hold the Zero 2030 Climate Conference, but it's a drop in the ocean, there's so much further to go. So despite all of these areas of either control or influence, there are massive gaps in power and policy that could be addressed only by national government. And what's more, councils have no statutory duty to deliver on the Climate Change Act. And this results in islands of good and bad practice with every council having to effectively find their own way through all of this with no coordinated central approach. So because of this lack of coordination, the CCC makes strong recommendations to government on what they need to do in relation to local authorities. And SECA members might want to review these um, to government when you're considering your step change program. So firstly, on policy, um, government are planning a net zero strategy but the CCC urges government to also develop a net zero delivery framework through which all government departments, all tiers of government, national and local, are aligned and coordinated and would bring all transport, planning, waste and other functions under the net zero lens. Um, and CCC urge government to really engage with local councils to clarify um, this framework so that they provide the additional powers needed locally, such as in planning. Secondly, they recommend government consider placing a duty on local authorities to act in accordance with the net zero strategy, which Scotland have done. Um, thirdly, they ask government to make policies consistent with net zero. So government is bringing forward loads of new strategies and policies including a net zero review of treasury, but they all have to work together and be joined up um, around the net zero agenda. Fourthly, to, do, um, to support area-wide planning for energy transport and building retrofit, which should include really robust area-wide energy planning and also transport decarbonisation plans with a duty to collaborate between the different agencies. Then they go into funding and support and the climate chain, uh, sorry, the CCC call for an increase in the revenue funding and support for local authorities so that they can develop the skills and capacity to plan and implement climate action. Many councils have been developing new climate posts at Adrian Worthing, we've upped our sustainability capacity from one to five in the last year, 
but this is difficult against a backdrop of budget cuts that makes it hard for many councils to follow suit. And there have been fantastic amounts of capital funding released to councils as competitions under the Building Back Better programme for things like active travel and public sector decarbonisation. But loads of councils are missing out on this because they simply don't have the in-house expertise and project pipelines to be able to secure those funds. So CCC would also like to see coherent cross-departmental support on climate action. Um, a great example that we experience of good um, departmental support is through the Heat Network Delivery Unit in Bays, which provided invaluable support to Worthing, and we just couldn't have progressed the Worthing Heat Network plans without them. The CCC would like funding to be non-competitive, long-term, completely aligned with net zero. Oh, oh my time is coming up. Um, so sorry. Um, I think I'd better just jump straight onto the recommendations um, for councils because that's really important. Um, so um, on councils, um, they want to see all councils developing um, a net zero climate action plan um, against which we've seen good progress. Secondly, to monitor and report on that. Um, hopefully there'd be a standardized approach to data gathering. Thirdly, to conduct policy and service reviews to align policy spending with net zero. Fourthly, to implement training capacity building so that staff and members um, have the skills around this. Fifth, to develop capacity to innovate and scale up so that um, councils have delivery projects so that they can jump on funding streams when they become available. Sixth, to collaborate with neighboring cross-tier local authorities um, on strategies and plans like the West Sussex example so that councils can cluster and share skills. Seventh, to develop green finance know-how um, we need to be kept finance savvy, savvy as we'll need private sector investment and green finance to deliver scale. Eighth, and crucially, to communicate and engage with local communities, an issue close to all of our hearts, that councils should support community action with citizens, schools, businesses and other groups. And finally, pension funds. So the CCC want to see disclosure of councils in their approach and more of a move towards net zero aligned pension fund investments. I think that's quite a robust list. It's interesting that offsetting sustainable food and climate adaptation and ecology aren't really come, they don't really come out in the recommendations, but um, they are largely there in the detail. So that's a really quick overview of the report. Um, and what it really stresses is that local authority roles are vital to achieving net zero, but it really needs to be backed up by a coherent national approach from government. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. And just, we will be having a Q&A at the end. So, you know, if anybody has questions for any of the speakers, then please do put them in the chat with a Q in front for question. And, um, and so we can come back to any kind of like additional information, hopefully when we've got time at the end. So moving on to Alistair from Friends of the Earth. Um, so Alistair, if you can tell us what you guys are all up to, over to you. Thank you and good morning everyone. It's nice to uh, see you all virtually, nice to see a few familiar faces. Uh, as well uh, this morning. Um, much what I'm going to say echoes and builds on what's already been said this morning, but I want us to start off with just to take a second and to rewind uh, to really appreciate the progress we've made perhaps over the last 10 years. If you were to think back 10, 11 years ago in the wake of uh, the failed Copenhagen talks, you'll note the, uh, the apathy there was, the lack of energy there was in tackling the climate emergency. And we knew that that needed to be addressed then and needed urgency then, but we couldn't get it going. But over the last decade, we've made real progress in building energy. I think the Paris talks, although it didn't deliver any, everything that was needed in 2015, really was a point of change for the public and the public mood. There was no longer these discussions 
as there were before that point around is climate change a thing we even need to worry about it's been well won now the arguments about the impact of climate change and the need to address it i think now is about channeling that energy into effective action that addresses the climate emergency and in the past we might as uh, might also have talked about sort of occasionally each certain years being key in tackling the climate crisis but I think probably the reality is now every single year, every single month is crucial in tackling the crisis as well. Uh, and no more so than this year. This year we have COP26 being hosted in uh, Glasgow by the British government uh, in October and November of this year. It's been delayed by a year due to the COVID pandemic. And that's made the importance of these talks even greater than usual really to ensure that we're on track or to get ourselves back on track and crucially to raise the ambition of action that is needed by governments around the world as well. So how do we leverage that and how do we make that uh, a success? Well, the first thing to say really is that there's real progress uh, or real momentum with us on this. I think one of the things you may have seen uh, a few weeks ago was Friends of Sister Organization in the Netherlands, Miria Defense, had a huge win in courts there over Shell, uh, where it challenged Shell on their action to tackle the climate crisis. And the court found that Shell had not been doing enough and ordered Shell to do much more. That's a totemic legal win and one that has sent ripples around the world through the oil and gas industry and through governments as well. And that builds on other wins that we've had in recent years. Friends of here in the UK, um, about 15 months ago, we had a win in the course of appeal over the building of a third runway at Heathrow. And while subsequently the Supreme Court uh, changed that, the Supreme Court still said that in the coming processes around the proposed building of that third runway, there must be consideration taken into things like the impact of climate change of building a third runway. And crucially, it's delayed progress of that and change and the external context has since changed then for the aviation sector as well. We've got a huge amount to do though. Uh, and I want to just focus on a couple of key areas. Frenzy uh, across England, Wales and Northern Ireland has been really pushing particularly for councils to get action plans in place over the last two years. And it's been so exciting to see so many councils do just that. It's been great to hear this morning a little bit about what's been happening here in the southeast uh, as well. And that needs to continue. But we need to help councils overcome some of the blockages that are preventing them from having more ambitious plans or the ability, crucially, to deliver those plans. For me, that means two things. It means pushing the government to ensure councils are getting the funding they need to be able to deliver these plans. This local action is absolutely crucial uh, for us to tackle the climate crisis nationally. And then councils need proper funding to be able to do that. Secondly, they need to be given the freedom to make the policies and choices they need. They need the powers to do this as well. But also the government needs to stop um, progressing policies that hamper this as well. The proposed changes to the planning system are a real threat to council's ability to tackle the climate crisis. It threatens green spaces. It threatens many other things as well, including crucially local democracy and local say. They need to radically change their proposed changes to the planning laws as well. And secondly, they also need to stop attacks on people's freedom to protest. So that means stopping things like the elements within the policing bill, which are hugely damaging to people's right to protest in this country. But alongside that, we know that in the year of the COP with the British government hosting it, that the eyes of the world are on how Britain acts and how Britain behaves in this as well. We've seen it already that the government has faced in acute embarrassment by their support for the coal, proposed new coal mine in Cumbria. And there's many other areas where the international uh, community is focusing on what Britain is doing and their actions as well and challenging them to do this. And we need to utilise that and this opportunity to challenge the government on their national level policies and how they are acting, to make sure that their decisions and their policies are in line with net zero and that they're taking far more ambitious action than they have yet to date as well. Their words are simply not met by their actions so far as well. In the months to come, we've got huge challenges, both in tackling the climate crisis, but also coming out of the COVID pandemic. But this gives us opportunities as well, I would hope. 
we know that we have huge challenges with employment. And a recent report by Frenzier found that potentially we could be creating 250,000 green apprenticeships each year for young people to take up if the government put in the right investment. These are good local opportunities for young people if that investment comes. As we approach the COP, we need to seize the energy and the focus on the government to challenge them, to support councils, to support communities, and to give opportunities to young people and many more to tackle this climate crisis in a huge range uh, of different manners, whether that be shifting policies, shifting funding to areas where it's needed most of this, or investing in those roles that will last people, particularly young people going into employment, jobs that they can have for life as well. It's been a pleasure to join you this, this morning and hope to hear more uh, as we progress as well. Thank you. Great, thanks Alastair and Dina. So Dina um, from Lewis Climate Hub is going to talk to us about how community groups can mobilise change. So over to you Dina. Hi, uh, yeah, um, well it's, it's Dina actually from Lewis Climate Hub. And um, the title of this bit that I'm doing is How Can Community Groups Mobilise to Create Step Change? And um, in Lewis, we have just opened a very sort of modest little climate hub, just a disused shop um, on the high street. And it's an alliance of environmental and social justice groups. And um, we think of the Climate Hub as a tree that draws on the grassroots of all the local hardworking organisations and builds a resilient trunk that branches off into all directions of the different areas of transport, housing, food, agriculture, um, waste, etc. And the flowers are all the projects that the tree gives out to sweeten the environment. And there are many reasons uh, why we uh, thought to do a, a climate hub. Many groups in the area are so busy working on their own projects that they didn't actually know what other similar groups were doing and were unable to work together. And uniting the groups gives them a bigger voice. It gives them stronger campaigns and has a bigger ripple effect in public awareness of the issues that they're working with. For example, if you have a BLM, Diversity, XR and LOSRAS, the uh, refugee groups all working together, the public is more aware of it generally. And linking the groups together enables more support, more input into projects and larger networks for them sharing information and greater access to greater resources like funding. And having the groups meet regularly, either online, which we've had to do all through the winter, but now in the last four weeks since we've opened, actually in our physical hub, um, it encourages cross-pollination of ideas and innovation. And we've seen that even when just three or four people from different organisations sit together for half an hour, the stuff that comes out of it is, is marvellous. And being on the high street, having high street presence, a physical presence means we are as accessible as we can be um, and we encourage engagement through our developing, I have to say developing because it's all very new, programme of talks, workshops and activities and having a space where groups can also use the window to promote their campaigns, open coffee mornings, poetry readings and surgeries all gets people knowing that we're there. The surgeries are a very good way of working with the town and district councils and helping to roll out their climate strategies to the public because we can have rolling sessions timetable to focus on housing, energy, transport, food, well-being, etc. And, oh, sorry, um, we can also host, um, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, we hope to promote the UN Sustainability Development Goals by encouraging the council's consultations to be showcased in the hub and on public display so people have time to engage because it's there all the time not just for one afternoon to ask questions to get answers and importantly to know where their con consultation output goes and how it is processed so it's not just a waste of time we can also host the lewis town neighborhood plan review which is a very important thing that's coming up in the hub and help people understand what is at stake in this big document and how to take part in it. 
Another aspect of the hub is that we can try out best practice models of self-organizing like holacracy and sociocracy rather than using traditional hierarchical systems. We can educate to some degree the wider public to understand the way we are governed, which is a mystery to most people, from parish to town to district and county councils and then to central government. And we can also show them um, how to raise their voices to achieve a fairer system of governments and where to direct their voices to lobby. We also can ask the town and district council to become more democratic by learning how to run people's and citizens assemblies. And we can importantly ask them to become more aware of the climate crisis by doing something like the carbon literacy training. So even though it's cross party, they all have a minimum of information. And I'm not talking across purposes, but singing from the same hymn sheet when it comes to making decisions. We can help publicize initiatives like the low cost housing scheme, which is different to affordable housing. It's based on the average wage in the area and what can be therefore expected as a rent. And we can help raise support and knowledge of it so it can be rolled out further than the town itself. And we can help create wealth and push for a local green circular economy through working with councillors we can point out opportunities that are obvious to us, but not obvious to them always, such as the need where we are for a wool cooperative to make local sheep's wool into insulation for local housing schemes or promoting partnerships between the local landowners who could host solar farms and local electric transport initiatives because we haven't got any buses. So we could own our own community buses and uh, power them with uh, solar. And we can spread the word on community, community renewable energy production to all of our different groups and projects in case there's room for them to engage with it. And we can signpost the public to co-housing and community land trust schemes because the housing situation is dire and nobody knows what's going on. So the Climate Hub is definitely more than the sum of its parts. At the moment, we have just touched on linking up with the universities. We've got two of them. We've got Brighton and Sussex, and they have community access programs and expertise in all kinds of areas, energy, air purity, transport. We have all this expertise on our doorstep. And now is the time for joined up thinking to limit the climate crisis. Another way to create step change is to promote through the hub to the public the three big switches. As you know, switch to a renewable energy company, switch to a non-fossil fuel investing bank, switch to a plant-based diet and come into the hub to find out how, because we can signpost people to all kinds of things, including recipes. These actions can create a groundswell that in turn can affect public opinion and the outcomes of things like people's assemblies. They can also act as an index as to what the councils need to do next. So the hubs can very much be a liaison facility as well as initiating projects and supporting campaigns like the law being debated in Europe at the moment against ecocide to protect environment. Hubs can be a one-stop shop for all things environmental, for building social justice and local democracy. And we can be an aid and a spur to the councils to take action on the climate crisis in a <laughs> not so timely, but badly needed and inclusive and regenerative way. So thank you and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dinah. And thank you very much for correcting me on your name as well. Dinah, thank you. So brilliant. So now we have our youth perspective and Tash has stepped in um, at the last minute. And so, so grateful as our, our last youth um, representative wasn't able to make it. So it's brilliant. And thank you so much. So over to you, Natasha. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to check if you can hear me first. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's perfect. So, um, hi, I'm here to provide something of a youth perspective on how we view climate change and how we act on it. Um, the first most obvious difference is that we've been raised within the climate change global warming narrative, 
So we haven't had that period of ignorance before learning of the implications of rising atmospheric CO2. Um, rather, we've grown up alongside the climate change narrative. Um, it's within our imagined future. And we know that the adults who came before us have failed to prevent the damage we're seeing to the Earth system. Uh, we also know that some of them even knew the risks of continuing to exploit um, fossil fuels and yet chose to ignore them. So uh, being a first generation climate change youth, whatever you want to call us, um, has created a confusing sort of disparity between the knowledge of the threat of climate change and the limited response we see around us uh, in schools, on all scales, councils, government, internationally. Um, for some of us, this disparity has been a driving force in the distrust um, in the systems which have supported uh, business as usual and upheld the status quo. I think you can see this in many young activists. Um, and for others, the knowledge response gap has caused a sort of mirroring of the complacent behaviours um, and inactions of the elders as they've grown up. Um, for those of us who have engaged, there's um, a significant emotional challenge attached um, to the task of action. Because obviously it shouldn't be up to young people to be whistleblowers and bear the weight of the future of the world <laughs> on our shoulders. And yet the pressing time limits required to stay below critical thresholds is compelling younger and younger people to make noise. Um, the challenge of this is amplified for young people surrounded by adults who may, for example, half-heartedly support green ideas, yet refuse to examine their fossil fuel use, their, how they vote, um, their meat consumption, et cetera. Um, moving on, the second difference is also an advantage for us in that we're the first uh, generation to grow up with the internet. So online, for young people, there are opportunities to self-organise, to take each other seriously, um, to find your tribe, educate and to learn as well. Um, we recognise our power to influence big polluters. So we're using that knowledge that interaction um, equals value online to choose who we support based on their environmental efforts or damaging um, behaviours. Um, also, it's important to remember that young people are less likely to have economic resources and voter power. Um, so this is a way that we can exert pressure. Um, since COVID, we've taken our activism further online. If you look at Fridays for Future blackouts, you can look at how we educate each other on TikTok and tweet storms, um, which is great, but we know that there's no time to wait for our generation to become the decision makers. Um, therefore, uh, the difficult task of convincing older people that we should be listened to remains. So as such, um, we're forming groups like Zero Hour, Polluters Out and the UK Student Climate Network, um, which are all created by young people for young people to amplify their voices and maximise impact. Um, they're together creating new climate change narratives around the world based from our climate urgent internet age perspective, um, which I see as uh, resulting in a shift to focus on the whole systems approach. Um, so intersectionality, between climate change and its impacts and other social issues is at the forefront of importance to us as a movement. Um, there's a widespread view among young activists that you cannot disconnect climate change from other aspects of life, um, that inequalities are amplified. So um, this is obvious when you look and see that climate change impacts are already being most felt by um, people of color, indigenous peoples, um, people in low-income countries, women, um, you can look at who's most affected by health problems from it, uh, poor air quality, who has access to green spaces and the demog uh, demographics of people um, who live on low lying land prone to flooding. Um, this means that intersectionality as a focus means that we're listening to historically silenced or underrepresented voices when they speak up on climate change. Um, you can find that on platforms like Instagram and TikTok. Um, we recognise these groups have been disadvantaged and oppressed by the same mindsets and systems that have led to climate change in the first place. So if you look up Elsa Migitsu, who's a Harvard University student, you can find uh, she's talking really clearly and explained that a lot better than I could. Um, many young activists are also calling for resources to be directed to these most uh, affected communities. You can look, um, some are calling for decision-making power to be passed to Indigenous peoples to manage the environments which traditionally theirs as well. Uh, other young people are taking their governments to court for failing to reduce their emissions and act on climate change, um, for disproportionately committing to future actions rather than present day action, um, for failing to protect their future mental and physical health, their rights to a healthy environment and their rights to life. And some of them are winning. 
Um, Germany, for example, recently revised its emission cuts targets as a result of being taken to court. Um, so that's five minutes. So I'll wrap up just by saying um, it's clear that as a youth movement, we're using innovative methods to get our perspective across despite the barriers we face. Um, and also that young voices are needed to better engage more young people. Um, I think older people can help by amplifying young and marginalised voices and by taking seriously the messages of the youth, which may extend out past the perceived limits of the climate change sphere. Um, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Well, I've got a question straight away. What is the um, Future for Fridays blackout? Um, it's just where you stop using stop using platforms as a means of protest because obviously interaction generates value for platforms. So by refusing to uh, engage with it, you're uh, yeah negatively impacting them, blacking them out. And yeah. Twitter storms is that the opposite? No, yeah. Twitter storm is where you yeah. just blast and keep putting the same thing on Twitter. Yeah, you, um, yeah. And I mean, I think that it would be really helpful for many groups within Seeker um, to be able to, you know, have some like youth training on this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether this could be facilitated that um, you, you know, others, you know, would like to help kind of facilitate that for members of Seeker that want to learn how to use TikTok, how to use Instagram platforms that are, they are not engaging on yeah. uh, through our networks. If they had the training from the youth, they would be able to amplify it a lot more. Yeah. So maybe this is something as a follow-up that, you know, if you would be up for helping, um, that could be something great that would come out of, you yeah. know, you know, we've got, you know, over these 100 groups and a lot of them are not savvy on, on using Instagram and TikTok. And so I think that it's really where we need your help there. Yeah, so it might be reassuring to know that the, like we have got online communities, they just might be invisible to yeah. older groups, so. Which is why we so have to, you know, this is what this is all about, is it's like being able to bridge all these gaps between, you know, black and white and old and young and everybody else. And so for us to be able to start using those same platforms, and I think now is really a time where, you know, you know, the older, you know, movement really, really needs to integrate a lot more and know how to use, you know, the platforms that you guys are all using. So thank you so much. And um, I am also, oh, can you also put Elsa's, what you was talking about Elsa, put her mm. link in the chat for everyone. Um, and so we're also coming up now for some other questions. So I will go kind of in order. There was one for you, Tony. Um, does the CCC sixth carbon budget meet reductions indicated in your slides? Ah, that's a good question. I think the answer is probably no. I think was it was it Dan came up with uh, some. I think he may know Dan from from CPRE may know know more about this than I do. But uh, from what I've seen of most things that we've heard, uh, nothing actually meets the reductions we actually need to achieve. Um, often, if we follow the things that we're supposed to be doing, like in the Paris Agreements, I think that might get us somewhere to somewhere towards about three degrees of warming, which is probably not survivable. So even the things that we're not achieving. <laughs> Uh, don't go far enough. I'm not sure about the sixth carbon budget, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if that, that was very, very similar. Yeah, and I don't know what Maureen also asked about the CDC's climate emissions survey, and it failed to get out to local people. Do you know why that was? Or maybe Francesca knows why? Um, if either of you have got any comments on that? Um, I, I was just going to pick up on the previous point that Tony was covering off. Um, the, the sixth carbon budget follows the Climate Change Act um, requ requirement, which is for a two to prevent a two degree warming. But as we know from the IPCC report um, back in 2019, end of 2019, 1.5 degrees warming is catastrophic. So um, the, the six carbon budget does actually, you know, it, it addresses this issue saying, you know, it would try to prevent two degree warming um, according to the UK emissions only, of course. Um, but, and it would try, it would work towards a 1.5 degree um, maximum threshold. But of course, it's still the same work needs to be done. We just need to do it even more urgently. We need to be doing everything now, really. 
Yeah, thanks. And Dina, there was a few for you. So how did you secure the space? How long do you have the space? How did you get the funds for it? And do you think a hub would work in a village as well as a town? So Dina, I don't know if you can like give a bit more info on the hub. Yeah, we uh, worked with the coronavirus volunteers because they were doing big stuff. Um, they actually got a prem. We both applied for a premises and we lost it to the coronavirus volunteers. It kind of sums it all up really by two votes. Uh, but then the coronavirus volunteers can actually take it as we moved out of lockdown and we actually got the space. We were going to share it with them, but now we have it on our own because they, uh, they, they've kind of they've done something else. Uh, we got a grant from the town council and most town councils have small grants. We only got a small grant enough for one year's rent. We're all run by volunteers. Uh, we got a reduced premises because it was in a district council building, although we can use a model of zero business rates if we declare ourselves as a charity or a CIC. Um, that's a community interest company. There's Because the buildings aren't being rented uh, because of recession and COVID, etc., businesses still have to pay high business rates. But if you're a charity or a community interest company, you can get 80 to 100% reduction in business rates. So although the owner doesn't receive any uh, rent, at least they don't have to pay the business rates, which can be substantial, like 15, 20,000 pounds uh, for a high street slot. I would advise anybody to get the people they've got, wherever they are, whoever it is, get them together, start working, publicize it. Other people will join. Don't wait for a bigger group. There's no time to wait. Do whatever you can do now and people will come. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that that's what, you know, all of us that are here on this call, we're on this call by nature because we are all active. You know, it's like action is the antidote to despair. And, uh, you know, rather than just going into this overwhelm of it's all too big and somebody else is going to fix it instead it's like well actually you know all of us you know are all part of that and, um, and i think that's what gives us you know as an alliance that power of feeling that we're not alone either that there's all these other groups that make us as seeker um all working in the same direction and you know and i just see this i've got this on my desk here i don't know if you can can you read this or is it back to front <laughs> It's back to front. Is it back to front? <laughs> I read it. It says, to talk about the future is useful only if it leads to action now. So that's really, you know, what, you know, we are all doing our bit and we all know that whatever we're doing is not quite enough. And so we have all got to do a little bit more and take it to the next level. So we're going to have a break now. And um, so we're going to have like a 10 minute break and, and then come back afterwards. So, um, so yeah, 11.35, we'll be back. So go and do what you need for 10 minutes and see you all back here at 11.35. See you then. Right, okay, so we want to change the tone a little bit now, and um, I think there runs the risk of being complete chaos now as we try to do all sorts of things, but um, I'd rather have complete chaos than silence. Um, what we're gonna try and do now is uh, change, change things around a little bit. Um, you've been sitting and listening to some extent, although we're looking at the chat, you've been really engaging as well. Um, what I want to do is try to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to turn it around so we're, we're, we're engaging more. We're engaging more with each other is the idea. So just to get us in the mood, I'd like to run a, run a few polls uh, just to see how you're feeling about things. Now, um, these polls are really just to get us thinking in a particular way. Then they're, they're not going to be real statistics or anything. So what I'd like you to do is just answer a couple of polls just to um, 
get us give us a feeling of where your thoughts are so so viv is the first is the first poll ready yet yeah, there we go so is your group looking for looking for opportunities to step up your impact do you are you are you aiming to step up your impact yeah, yes you're already doing so well no you'd like to but you, you, you can't manage it yet or no we're flat out and we can't possibly consider any more where, where where's your group at the moment and uh, you submit your response replies and, we'll, and we'll, we'll have a look we're going to make this very quick fire we're not going to linger on any of this at all so as soon as you get the results uh, viv will put the results up for me to look at i hope how's that going viv yeah, that's okay. Actually, we've got 80% voted, so just over 80%. So I think we'll end the poll, share the results. End the poll, what does it say? Over. Yes. Yes, already doing so. Yes, you, you want to step up your impact. So, uh, quite a, a few, 30% would like to. There's only a small, that's, that's actually really good news. Only a few people say, no, God, we're flat out. I expected more of that, so that's rather good. So it gives us a taste. We're up, Okay, we're up for more. Okay, what's the next poll then? Righto, second poll coming up. There we go. Oh yeah, great. So so a lot of people say it will affect you, affect it a bit. Uh, quite a few say significant, significantly. Very few say no difference at all. Well, that's that's encouraging, isn't it? Uh, a few not sure, which I'm not surprised about because yeah, we can't necessarily be sure. E excellent. So let's run the third poll, which I think will take a little bit more time, but I'm not going to give you much more time because you're going to have to speed up. <laughs> okay. Put the scores think, on the doors. I think we're there. Let's. Um share results and let's have a look at those oh a lot for lobbying yeah great okay uh fairly evenly spread uh not so much for challenge through the legal process that's interesting i'm sure i'm sure that's really important but uh i think a lot of people aren't going to be doing that changing mindsets yes great concrete projects but actually it looks like lobbying has a lot of uh support actually almost the same lobbying and public outreach great stuff okay let's close that well, that's given us a bit of a, a bit of a taste, you know, to engage us a little bit to um, think about how we're going to uh, how we're going to react. But what I want to do now is this is going to be the chaotic bit. Let's let's see if it works. <laughs> Great fun. We're going to try and break you into random breakout groups, and we've had several meetings with facilitators. So ho hopefully, everybody, every group will get a facilitator to help you go through this. And I'm going to issue you some rules of engagement. To start with, uh, I don't know about you. I mean, a lot of looking around the table, I think a lot of you are probably very familiar with going to different meetings and conferences and groups. Um, it's not necessarily the ones that have objectives and uh, want to deliver a plan and uh, have a great output. It's not necessarily those, those are the ones that you remember. Often it's the ones where you come away with a nugget, which has really changed the way you think. Maybe just one thing. We're also long in the tooth. It's unlikely we'll come away from a conference thinking, oh, that's changed my life. But you may come away with a nugget. Maybe that nugget changes your life. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping is that all of you are going to have something you've either heard today from somebody else, another day from somebody else, or they've come, you've come in with an inspiring idea that you want to share. So this is the idea that you, you're, um, you've got some inspiring ideas in, around the room. You've all got them. And uh, what we want to do is just hear, what, we just, just want to hear them. Are there any inspiring ideas which will really add together to help with this stepwise change that we're going to have to go through. So we're not going to come up with really practical long lists of things to do. We should take the reins off. Let's take the, take the constraints off our thinking. Let's think, how can we actually, you know, what, what inspirational ideas have we heard? When I was really inspired by, by Natasha, for example, and the way she's thinking across, you know, cross function. For example, you know, I heard another inspiring idea the other day about how about a, um, how about a, a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that we get everybody to sign up to. For example, so things like that, just nuggets. So we're looking for those those nuggets, and the way we hope this 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 uh, chaotic breakout group will work, you'll all be put into your random groups, so you won't necessarily know who you're going to get. And what we'd like you to do is go around the table, very very simply. Um, and when you go around the table, you quickly introduce yourself and where you're from, and you've got a total of two minutes to basically say. Here's the, the nugget of inspiration that I that I've heard that I want to track that I heard today. I've heard another time. Double. I'm already thinking about whatever it is. Um, you maybe have heard something from somebody else, some uh, you know el elsewhere in, in 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 the in the group that you thought, hey, that's interesting. I want to want to repeat that. So nuggets of in, of inspiration that you've actually heard. So yeah, for just two minutes introducing yourself saying what those nuggets are now the idea is that uh, we'll go around the table everybody will get a turn to speak um i think uh, nicola gave a really good analogy in one of our earlier talks it's, it's like the uh, native american use of a, of a talking stick when you get your talking stick you can talk for two minutes 
without interruption or contradiction or discussion, it's your bit. And then you pass the talking stick on. Another rule of engagement though, is when people are in groups, they tend not to be listening. They tend to be thinking about what they're going to say. <laughs> I know we're all guilty, aren't we? So don't do that. Don't think about what you're going to say. Forget what you're gonna say, listen to everybody else. This is the point. Um, it'll come when you, when you say it. And actually you'll have time to think about what you're going to say in the kind of one or two minutes as the breakout group, groups form themselves. So think about it then. But uh, give everybody else the courtesy of listening carefully to what they say as you go around the room. And avoid, don't use the chat at all, stay in the moment about what people are saying. See, you know, listen to that inspiration you're hearing around the table. Now I'm just gonna check my notes to see what I've forgotten. Um, Everyone speaks for just two minutes. The, the facilitators are there to kind of kick you off, keep you, uh, I mean, start you off, you know, uh, start you going and keep you to time. So they may have different methods of trying to keep you to time. I'll be amused to hear what they did. Um, and then after this, we all come back together again. The, you don't need to do anything when you, you'll be put taken into your rooms and then you'll join that room, press join. And when you come back again, it'll all be automatic. You'll come back here after 30 minutes. And then after 30 minutes, we have about 20 minutes where we um, encourage maybe some of the best ideas you come up with uh, to come out. You know, some of the facilitators may say, Fred, you say something that was really good. And oh, there, that was really good. You, you bring that back to the main meeting. See if you can get see if you can get everyone to listen to that. And uh, at that time, uh, we're going to be having uh, Sherry Clark, who's working on a Miro board uh, behind the scenes. So you won't see it. She'll be listening to what everybody's saying. This is in the main meeting when you come back. She'll be listening to what everybody's saying and putting up virtual post-it notes of some of the good ideas and trying to cluster them and group them in a particular way. So if you imagine a whiteboard, you, you've all done it, haven't you, at these conferences, you have a whiteboard and then you pin your ideas up with a, with a post-it note. It's the virtual equivalent of that. Um, no idea how it works. I'm not the expert in this by a long way, but so I'm relying on Sherry. So we'll be having that discussion for about 20 minutes. Um, when she'll be doing this in the background and then there'll be a great reveal and we'll see what what actually we've all said so that's the kind of background as i said the um my greatest fear is that there will be silence i don't think you'll let me down though <laughs> i think there'll be chaos and that's going to be fine so how are we with the breakout breakout group organization Viv? are we ready it's a uh, difficult in a sense to do it at this stage because it's random but then we've got uh, um, leaders for each group so um, I'm going to um, get you all into breakout rooms. You will automatically go. We have uh, half an hour there. I will give you a five minute warning and then the last countdown is a minute. So good luck everybody and let's press some buttons, see what happens. I suspect we're back there now, aren't we? Excellent. Well, I hope that was fun and we'll have a little bit of a feedback in a, in a little while. Um, yes, um, quickly before, before we do that, um, I think there's there's things we can actually look at already. Sherry's already been doing some work by picking out some of your comments from the chat line and putting it on the Miro board. So if we can have a very quick look, I don't expect you to read this, but I want you to just notice something about what we're picking up here. If we can uh, share your screen. Sure, thanks, Tony. Um, just to explain, yeah. can, can people see um, yeah. lots of little post it. So for those who don't know, Miro is a digital whiteboard. Um, it's online. For those of us who love post-it notes, um, what you'll see is that this is for, for, for COVID-19, all these WYSI tools that have been started. And what I've been doing is picking up, as Tony said, from the chat and from some of the presentations, just some of the main points as much as I can. So we've got, um, we've got a, a our own wall that we can add to through the rest of the session today. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, and just in, one, one thing I notice about that and is it's just the sheer volume of stuff, even, even now before we even, even have the discussion. And just to say, you know, what's going to happen here? This is going to be used as source material for our discussions in the executive meeting. So we're not heading for a major kind of expose of the brand, brand new plan by, by the end of half an hour. Now, this is just going to be source material. And also the difference between there's a lot of action here, a lot of things wanting to be done, but there's also a lot of contemplation and thinking as well. So I think we need the, the balance between the two. There's, there's going to be, you know, pure practical action can set you off in all the wrong directions, but just sitting around thinking gets nothing done. So we need the balance between the two. 
So that's kind of where we are and what it kind of looks like. What I'd like to do now is I think the best way to handle this is to just go around the rooms and see if anybody's got some, some nice ideas they want to feed back. And uh, I'll see if uh, Sherry can write them down. So in room one, we had, we had Danny doing the facilitating. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to bring back from room one, Danny? Yeah, quite, quite a lot. Firstly, I'd like to thank my group, um, six of us, and some inspiring thoughts. Um, and, and if you like, uh, Tony, we can go to the individual if need be. But I'd like to just pick up on uh, Sue um, from Haven't, who talked about the song for the climate, um, which is uh, something that's been developed. And Sue, could you just say a little bit more? I think it's, this is a fantastic idea, which everyone would like to hear. Sue from Haven. Uh, this is an idea we've been discussing across the Hampshire groups. Um, because there's a rather excellent song, very, very catchy, very easy to learn. And um, in some of the European countries anyway, they've managed to get huge choirs together with everybody singing it. We're not sure whether we can do that, but we could certainly get small groups singing it and putting it together. And, uh, and I also mentioned that the Portsmouth Music Hub's got some great environmental songs that uh, are free to use. So I'll put links to both in the chat now. OK. Thanks, Sue. That's great. Um, then we had uh, Debbie um, from Chichester. Um, just picking up on the key things she was saying, her, her view, I think, uh, uh, Debbie, if I've got this wrong, please interject. Too many groups, uh, the cohesiveness, um, it's fragmented. And uh, um, bringing, bringing the groups together to, to get better focus. Um, she was most uh, interested to hear about the community hub and uh, looking at, um, you know, picking up on the mistakes that have, have happened in Chichester before and, and then effectively building back better as part of the COVID recovery. Um, and the other thing that started to get picked up in, from Debbie and others was this issue about engaging those in the lower income group, those who are impoverished, not just because of COVID. And how do you engage with them when their priorities are not climate, biodiversity, or ecosystem losses? Um, so that was Debbie, uh, Emma, uh, Arundel, um, and this was Mind the Gap. This is the connecting the link between what's going on in terms of road developments, better campaigning between what's, what's going on in terms of roads and climate change. Very concerned about the Arundel bypass. Uh, very came across very, very loud and clear. Um, and then to uh, Chrissy from... Uh, Can I say uh, something? Yeah, of course, a bigger poem. <clears throat> I've looked up Song for the Climate. I want to check with Sue. Is it this song? We're on a planet that's got a problem. That's that's oh, it. fantastic. It's one of the songs that I did with my temporary choir 18 months <laughs> oh, ago. Right. I'm so pleased. And we've all got an earworm now, haven't we? <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah. Um, so we go to Herefordshire and uh, uh, Chrissy, we talked about adopt a supermarket. Um, Chrissy, do you want to say something about that? I think it's, this is a fantastic idea, focusing on plastic use. Yeah, I'll just briefly say um, my idea was, as, as Danny said, adopt a supermarket um, where one could adopt a local branch um, and demand the, su the supermarket. Um, yeah, uh, reduce their plastic. Um, use and then eventually cut it out altogether um, and that this could relate to um, those with financial difficulties you could bring in the fact that you know recycling uh, and buying new packaging every time as well as the product is actually more expensive um, and um, uh, yeah to, to, to sit outside uh, a supermarket with a petition asking shoppers to sign this petition eventually presenting it to the supermarket but also at the same time giving shoppers information about damaging uh, nature of plastic um, and raising awareness at the same time. Great, that sounds, sounds really good. Thanks yeah. Chrissy. Um, and then we, uh, B from Henfield uh, was talking about, again, how COVID has stopped action and it's now just uh, kick, re kick starting everything. Pre-COVID, yeah. COVID, they had <clears throat> ideas about a repair cafe um, and so on. Um, so lots of thoughts about monthly uh, stall, um, they've got big biodiversity groups in the area. So again, it's, a, it's bringing that all together and offering sustainable uh, alternatives um, in, a, in a better way. Um, and COVID hopefully will, will push that forward. B, did I get that right? Anything you want to add? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, okay. Christine from Friends of the Earth, the last, um, hampered by COVID, 
um, lost lost the uh, a coordinator, couldn't cope with ID. So this is the, when you when you've got this digital um, in poverty when you can't reach those who need to be reached or don't or those who don't have the skill sets. Um, they wanted some uh, wanted some big ideas for the big green week. Wanted to focus on that. They like the choir. Um, very concerned about carbon production plans by the local council. Um, no money against some of the actions in the plan and no people monitoring these plans and actions. So quite concerned uh, um, in, in that respect. Christine, is it, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything further about that. No, okay, and I think okay. and finally, um, Tony, um, social media. Again, uh, this is part of the digital divide and getting clarity about not being fragmented you know um what do we use twitter TikTok, facebook linkedin what what is what's going to get the best reach and maximum impact interesting and very interesting people are yeah, looking for guidance on that yeah group two was was led by rod thick and rod yeah. what what do you want okay. to say from your group thank you yes um we had a, a brilliant discussion and we came up with six very good ideas i'll just quickly run through the ideas and then if anybody in the group would like to come in and sort of um, elaborate a bit, a bit more. Um, the first one was a column in local newspapers. This is being done, I think, in the Horsham area. It's something that could be very useful, especially lead, leading up to COP26. Um, number two, a green directory of all the local groups and organisations who deal in the, in, in, the green, in the green economy, especially. Um, Number three, the youth could train us up in technology. That's leading on from the um, discussions earlier this morning. Um, number four, a site, of, um, it was mentioned about a couple of the people um, rewild their gardens or part of their gardens to put a sign up saying why they're doing it and perhaps to attract the bees or whatever. And so as the public can see when they're going past. And number five was working with a college, with colleges. Um, Carrie mentioned about with um, her milk float, they could sort of take that on for the summer holidays, that sort of thing, or even have a stall in the in a in a market or somewhere like that for young people to get the message out to older people, which I think is very important. And lastly, um, consider repairing instead of throwing things away, which of course, um, which was Simon mentioned from his um, repair cafe that he works with in the the Horsham group. So that's our six ideas. Would anybody like to um, come in and sort of say a few words about anything else that were within the group that is? Can I just interrupt super quickly? I got five of the six. I got the column in local newspapers, youth training and social media, green directory, working with the colleges. What am I missing? A uh, sign about rewilding in the garden. Yeah. And consider repairing instead of throwing things away. Thank you. Great, great. Lots of good stuff there. Excellent. Oh, that was, that was very quickly done as well. Thank you very much. Moving to room three. Uh, Chris Lee, what, have you got any good ideas from there? I'm sure you have. What are your good ideas? I'll pass you over to Pat, who had a, a, a thought or two. Pat, in Dorking Climate. Um, yeah. Um, number one, we're starting, <clears throat> we're starting up a climate hub in September, October. And, um, and I thought it would be brilliant if everybody who's interested in doing that could get together in some way and share ideas and practical tips um, because that's such a visible way of showing where we are you know and, and making a public making ourselves felt and and secondly um the um the donut economics by kate rayworth there are some excellent videos done by her on youtube and we used one as the basis of a <clears throat> of a series of climate cafe Zooms and um, quite a few groups sort of taken this on board and they're running with it as a circular economy, if not donut. So um, that's wow. it. Thank, that's you. Thank, thank, thank you, Pat. Um, and Dan, you had a couple of points. Yeah, I think um, one thing that was apparent in our, our group when people spoke, and I think this is probably common to all the local groups is that the the average age is too high. So we need to see more uh, younger people engaging, uh, you know, more people like Cressy, for example. But there are lots of young people in the area who, who are looking, I think, probably for a way to engage. 
but maybe um, as local groups, which are very important in all this, um, local action is key to this because it's through small actions that we got where we are in a way. Um, so these local groups are important, but we, I don't think the younger generations are aware of the local group's existence even. So we need to do a little bit more to reach out to, to people. So the local groups have uh, more energy and more public presence. So I, I think that would be a very good thing to happen. It's the main thing that I noticed, if you like, uh, out of the comments. Can I, can, I, can I abuse my chair's position and come up with something here? Because I've noticed something as well. And that is we talk about uh, getting young people more engaged in the sense of how they can help us with what we're doing. What I picked up from Natasha was actually uh, there's a shift in power. They're going to be saying how we can help them with what they want to do. Excellent. And I think that's completely right. Um, we're engaged in Fairwell Dinfield. We're engaged with the West Sussex County Council Youth Cabinet. And I wonder if these cabinets, these youth cabinets exist in other councils. So we have taken that stance. How can we help them? And uh, yeah. we're, we're having conversations with them now. Um, I think that was all from our group, except one point that did come up was about, uh, we've talked about doing things collectively today, uh, but Dan mentioned about as individuals, people feel overwhelmed. So how do we, he said, I think Dan, isn't, is how do we yep. inform individuals in a way that's not too much for them really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was pleased to see, see quite a lot of action on Sherry's uh, list, yeah. Yeah. but uh, it would be nice if Seeker could, you know, as a bit of a ring holding organization, Try and have a, a list, you know, what are the top 10 things you could do most readily? Yeah, interesting. Great. OK, moving on. I think, uh, I think that's that, yeah. yeah. So, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, Group 4, Peter Desmond. Uh, yeah, um, we had a um, Paul in the uh, call uh, with Gabe, Morag and Christine. Um, we, we were inspired by um, all the talks, particularly um, Natasha, as others have said, um, and also Diane and the Lewis Hub. So they that generated conversation. For example, Marek mentioned about having a blackout as um, they um, we did with the uh, boycotting after the phone hacking uh, problem. Um, Paul isn't going to speak. Um, he's going to speak later. So his suggestion was about something called climate mobilization um, from the, from the US. Um, that would be something to, which was took us onto a war footing. And I think we felt that we weren't on a, a war footing. And Gabe, who's a, a newly elected councillor in Ada, um, walking um, the pavements, talking to people that uh, it, people just don't get it, really. And um, cross party politics is the way forward. Um, now, Christine is um, multitasking at the moment. And I'm not sure I'd really like to appreciate her if she could uh, uh, just share some of the thoughts that she had. And if she's not able to, um, then I will throw some things in um, or else ask for um, um, uh, Gabe, who, uh, um, if you wanted to say something about the, uh, the thoughts you had on a Shoreham hub. Um, which, there. Yes, great. Um, which points did you want um, uh, me to well, talk to you in particular? <laughs> or you can, <laughs> you well, end up anything saying you anything. like, any nuggets you've got. Um, women at the top was, was definitely something that you said. Um, also, it's not just about climate, it's also about biodiversity, how um, we need to bring, make sure we have youth included and the global south and anything else you'd like to throw in as well. Um, yeah, I think I've just, I've been working with some organisations globally and across Europe just um, on um, scrutinising the country's recovery plans and it just exposed how uh, the Commission is not really enforcing um, biodiversity at all it's putting all its money towards climate and even that it's not enough it's only um a minuscule amount and basically biodiversity and climate come hand in hand um and also women take these um climate emergency issues much more seriously oh, oh sorry that's a generalization of course um but we see very few women at the top at cop and there was a big campaign to try and get more at the, more women on board um and oh. sorry yeah i've lost my train of thought oh, no, I, uh, <laughs> thank that's, you that's fine thank you and that's i think fine, it was uh, something that the men on the call did a nod um agree completely um and paul uh hannon was was talking about non 
traditional techniques we should think about using and um, uh, how to change habits. But um, I think that might right. be it for the moment, Tony. Excellent, excellent. I'm just noticing our time shifting on now. They're all such good ideas, such a lot of really inspiring thoughts there. Can we move on to Mark Francis in room five? Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so our group generally it was a bit nervous that we need to break out of the bubble. I'm sure we all are. We keep talking to the same people. Um, but Dinah's going to say something in a moment. She was very, very enthusiastic about industrial hemp. I think I persuaded us to talk about something which links in with uh, Natasha's stuff. So over to you, Dinah. Yeah, in relation to getting young people on board, um, in, even in the Climate Hub, which is, tries to be as, very, uh, as inclusive as it can, We've really struggled to engage young people, maybe through COVID people or worried about university places or work. Or, but we do have a mentoring scheme to teach uh, young people how to podcast so that they can be in charge of the material. Basically, like being a DJ running their own radio station, linking up with other, say, hubs or networks, making podcasts that can be saved. And apparently young people listen to podcasts. And what we like to do is put young people in charge of what is broadcast and the stories that are told in the hope that it will get a integrated and busy cross network. <clears throat> We're happy to mentor people to do that. It's trying to find people to do that. And even with social media, we really desperately need social media people, but it's breaking into young people's networks to know how to find them. But we'd really like to put them in charge of the narrative. Excellent, interesting stuff. Thanks, Diana. And then Anne had some concerns about hydrogen, which I think she'll share with us. You're on mute probably, Anne, wherever you are. Sorry. Yeah, it wasn't an inspirational idea. It was really a warning because um, now that oil and gas companies are seeing the, the writing on the wall about re reducing the use of, the, of, of oil in particular, they're turning to hydrogen and the government is treating it as a big silver bullet as though it's going to answer so many problems. Now in the southeast, there are two oil companies already talking about extracting gas and using it as a uh, as a source for creating hydrogen. Now, if you create hydrogen from gas, you actually use, you create many more emissions than you would using the gas directly. But the hydrogen itself, when it's done, is, is a clean fuel, and that is what they're pushing. Um, there, there's absolutely no plans for any kind of carbon capture and storage in the southeast. The government is putting a lot of money into two hubs in the north, but there's nothing in the southeast. So the current plans are that they're trying to produce hydrogen, increase the local emissions, and, um, mm. and but selling it as a clean fuel. So yeah, we really need you. to be very careful. Thanks. That can go on our list of concerns, but <laughs> that could be quite a big list. So I think we'll stick with inspirational ideas if we can. Yeah, but that's um, useful. Thank you. And um, Silla, Silla was looking for, had problems regarding house building and planning and things like that. So I don't know if you wanted to say something about that. Your yes, I was just really sort of saying what a central issue housing and planning law is. It brings together so many issues in terms of um, thinking about uh, and, and concerns in this area in the South East, certainly in West Sussex, um, where big developments on greenfield sites are being pushed on. Uh, on the public. Um, biodiversity, uh, the, the madness of giving planning permission now to houses that are going to have to be retrofitted in terms of their heating and insulation um, in the relatively near future. Um, um, transport, you know, commitment, what sort of a commitment is, is there in the, the um, current development to um, electrification of vehicles, connectivity, uh, cycling and walking, how, you know, these are such crucial areas. Um, and I also feel that councils have a responsibility, and I know that West Sussex has it, has it in their climate action plan for lobbying central government in terms of legislation. And I wonder how much are they actually doing that? And what can we do to, to encourage them to um, jump on that? Um, it feels very urgent uh, because as I say, it's, it's 
coming up now or changes in planning planning law. Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, good. So I notice we've still got three groups to go through. Go through. So let's pep it up with some good ideas. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's the end of our group. I was just going to say we'd like to have these go-to experts for things like planning and in the yeah. southeast who we know have got all the relevant information. They're completely up to date, and we know where to go that's, to get that information. Well, that's a good right. idea. That is yeah, the excellent. end of our group. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Tom Broughton. I think uh, for group uh, six, any any inspirational ideas from there? Okay, Tony, I observe uh, what you just said about being a bit more quick. So Sorry. I'll just go through the list of uh, our group members and see what they said. But if anybody in our group want to feed back a bit more, please come back at the end. So we had Les from Hanover and Brighton who had a great idea about developing some sort of totalizer idea, like the Blue Peter a totalizer, which shows how well we are doing towards a target. And perhaps if we could have the same totalizer in every community and, and then everyone gets familiar with the idea, this is our target and this shows you how well we're going towards a target. Everyone's seen thermometers outside cathedrals for their fundraising. So that sort of, I, I really like that visual idea. Finding the data for that target would be interesting, but that's not the problem. The, pro the issue is getting the totalizer visible. Uh, Mandy from Southampton uh, was talking about how in her area they developed a local air quality project and they got involved with the universities and how that then project then got adopted by the local council and then got promoted in their um, air quality plans and so really showed how a small local group can create a project which is then adopted by the, the wider council. Alison really liked the ideas of the hubs and surgeries involving councillors uh, uh, you know, and but uh, then the idea came out: is there some sort of toolkit that could be developed in order so that that idea can be replicated again around around the Seco area? Um, Gonzalo uh, from the UNA he uh, talked about the generation restoration project that the UNA are, are promoting, where from the micro level through to the larger level, uh, they, they if their project is uh, rewilding or uh, bringing biodiversity back into the their space, they will get a certificate. And that certificate could then be used to, to show the, that area has been, uh, has been shown to be uh, improving the biodiversity. And Jay was very much uh, of the opinion that public opinion is very much lagging the urgency. And he re reminded us of the drink drive campaign, how that really raised the issue of drink driving and how it became, uh, you know, politically, or sorry, socially unacceptable to drink and drive but then also the response to covid you know the public will respond to an urgent situation if it's presented as an urgent situation and that is my review of our group anybody in the group wants to say anything Excellent. more that's very good very good again more really good ideas but let's let's move on then if that's, the, that's okay uh, to emily mott and uh, group seven yeah, hi. Um, we had some good feedback and I, uh, inspiration. Um, Tony from Henfield Sustainability one it was suggested perhaps a coordinated consumer action, um, drawing on Natasha's idea of a blackout action. Um, and Catherine, let's see, Jill suggested that we just talk more to people. Again, drawing on Catherine Hayhoe's idea of just conversation, keep the conversation going. I mean, we've we've heard that before, but really making an effort. And we discussed how to really talk to people who aren't converted. You know, how do we reach, how do we reach communities more, um, like Haven't or parts of Haven or Chichester or the schools. Um, then Philip was inspired by lots of things that one of our councillors, Sarah Sharp, is doing with cycle lanes and cycle forum and eco chai. Um, from Brighton Hove, Friends of the Earth, David has started an inspired project called Radio, um, Granby Radio Station to launch before COP26. So it's going to have 50% music, 50% spoken word. Um, really a forum connected to the planet. So keep, keep an eye out about that. And he's interested in connecting with, with youth as well. And also anyone here um, at the conference, he can speak more to that later or, or put a link. Um, and Sally is gonna put more energy towards lobbying MPs. 
um, I was inspired by the Save Our Help Our Help Our Kelp um, um, campaign, which was fantastic, which resulted in a fantastic 300 square kilometers of protected um, waters in the Solent. So it's all from us. Great stuff, yeah. great stuff. Moving on. And lastly, Karen Park and your group eight. Uh, anything in, inspired your group? And lots of uh, good ideas discussed. I'm just okay. going to hand over to Keith, who was talking about um, retired people having more time being able to step up and step back. Yeah, yes, I guess the, the we started off with the, with the notion that uh, creativity emerges on the edge of chaos. So I, I think you're creating a chaos, Tony, in all of this is a very good place to generate ideas and action. Um, just to mention that Seaford Environmental Alliance now has a, a building downtown that will be opening up shortly, that will be a permanent building uh, as it's a registered charity. So linking this other, I know there's other groups here. And so linking with that would be exciting. Um, also excited with uh, Dinah Morgan's um, sort of getting counselors this climate literacy training and, and I re recently wrote and shared a, a resource to the a counselor and a mayor in Seaford. And the training's a little bit more expensive. So networking with Lewis and with others, and maybe the district council could make that sort of education route happen. And also how to get the same kind of training into our schools, principals, um, higher up, and we talked about teach the future um, and intergenerational collaboration, but maybe um, Natasha would like to uh, sort of um, lead on so I don't take up all the time. We were just speaking about how with younger groups, it can be there are a lot of um, sort of social expectations to respect what older people are saying and their voices and often we feel that our voices can get squashed underneath that. So when if you really want uh, young people to engage with what you're doing, I think probably the best way is to enter in to what they're already doing, let them take the lead, learn from what they're already doing, and then see if they're willing to collaborate from there. Because if you bring your ideas and your voice, it can be quite dominating and sort of um, suppress what we're already trying to do. Uh, even if the ideas are really sort of radically, seem really radically different or, um, I don't know, yeah, just I think listen and learn from the bottom and then let them lead and then see where you can collaborate from there. Great, thank yeah, you. Great. That's it from our group. <laughs> that's it from your group, Matt. So I think that's 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 all of it there. There's there's loads of stuff coming coming through. Um it might be nice if 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 uh, if Sherry can share the 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 Miro board. There's lots of stuff here. And I want to stress that this is the source material that we're going to be taking to our next executive meetings. And the other thing I want to stress is that we'd like more people to come along to that and engage with this because you can see why what's happening there. God, you've done a really good job of bringing some of this uh, <laughs> this up. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, bringing this together. And some of you came up with some really good ideas that are good not just to come and kind of tell us about, but actually there's going to be some need to take on some responsibility to run with some of these ideas, take them on as individuals, something like that, because we can't point to an imagined centre and think somebody else is going to do it. So it's the idea of, um, yeah, there's some really good stuff here. We'll try to bring all this together somehow, um, but it'll be the source material for the next executive probably meetings, not one meeting, I think. Um, yeah, it struck me that there's lots of general things coming out. There was words like um, intersectoral, the idea of cr uh, crossing over. Um, I failed in my talk to mention I was going to say that this is a climate emergency, but it's also an ecological emergency and a humanitarian emergency, and they're all one emergency. So I think that's come through as well, uh, that this is actually intersectoral. We shouldn't look in one corner all the time. Um, great stuff. Great stuff. Um, I don't think there's much. I, if Sherry, is there anything you want to say about what you think you're seeing? From yeah, just a very, very quick one. Just I mean, obviously, it's it's there's an overwhelming amount of stuff here. Um, and I, I did capture some of the concerns that people brought up through the groups. I just wanted to say, you know, it's, it's so um, enriching to be part of a group where 
so much of the focus in the conversational groups was on positive, inspiring ideas. And just as I was listening, you know, as, as people were speaking, I was feeling so much better because I was looking at this board during the, during the breakout room time thinking, oh my God, this feels totally overwhelming, which is such an obvious thing that, you know, when we start to look at what's out there. But as you listen to people speak and they tell these stories of these amazing ideas, you can't help but feel, okay, there's things yeah. going on. This is great. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Yes, excellent stuff. Well, I think that reflects what I was hoping for, actually, because when I gave my starting talk earlier on, I thought this could be awfully depressing and we'll just get a list of concerns. But I think I was summarised before I pass over to Paul by saying that what, what I hoped was is that stressing the scale of the problem won't make us depressed and De de demotivated it should make us do the opposite and make us make us want to demand more it should make us angry and should make us active and want to do things so i think that's what we seem to have achieved here we haven't got a list of worries isn't it isn't it all terrible it's all going to end soon we've actually got a list of things that we want to do and there seems to be that balance between you know uh, con concepts thinking imagining new imagining better and actually the practicality of doing uh, i said said earlier in, in the break the difference between being a human being and a human doing so we seem to get that balance quite nicely here. So we'll take this material away and I hope more of you will join us in the in the executive meeting and see if we can make some cut. Sorry? It's a steering group. Steering group, that's much better. Yes. Why did I think it was an executive? <laughs> it's not an executive. So Excellent. People are very welcome to join us at the steering group, particularly if you feel that you can lead on something. Yeah, that's the key point. I'm glad it's called a steering group meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a member since the start. I should remember, shouldn't I? Anyway, yes, we'd be very keen for other people to join us there. It is very open. So, uh, yeah, that would be great. I think now uh, I can't possibly summarise key points. I, I said I wouldn't anyway. So I think what I'll do now is say thank you very much, everybody. That was a fantastic engagement. As I predicted, you weren't silent. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Paul to kind of uh, do the last section before we hand over to Nicola and Carrie to finish us off. Paul, are you there? I am indeed. Um, thanks, Tony. And uh, quite an amazing morning. So many different issues, and I really enjoyed the, the group I was in. So I want to um, speak for, well, I'm going to speak for five minutes and try and compress what I normally talk about for an hour or so about the nature of change. And um, because we've heard a lot of ideas today, but the fact is, how do we actually change? We want individual change, community change, local national policies change. We want systemic change. And, you know, I've worked in this field um, of change management, behavioral change for over 30 years. And I just want to end with some lessons that I've learned, um, which might be useful to you here. And then finish with, if you like, a rallying call for what uh, I think a seeker could be in terms of trying to get the sort of agenda that we've been discussing to actually make something happen here. Um, in my view, too many change campaigns fail because they're poorly designed and they're based on incorrect assumptions. Uh, and here are some ways of minimizing risk. First of all is ensure you're working with the key stakeholders. Sometimes we like to work with the people who we find easiest to work with, who are most like us. But when you're in a change process, you have to learn how to work with people who you don't agree with. You know, um, I'm a member of the Green Party, but I know I have to work with people of all political uh, persuasions. We have to think, you know, across the board and not just work with people we enjoy working with. And the more inclusive we can be, the better. As sev several people have said, you know, looking around everybody here, we are still a very narrow um, group of people and we have to get out to the mainstream and find innovative ways. And we've heard quite a few in the different groups of getting out to people. Next, I think it's making it relevant to people's everyday lives. You know, when I first started out uh, 25 years ago in environmental change and management, I thought, People, as soon as they know the facts, that's all they need to know. You know, as soon as people realise what we're doing to the planet, surely that's enough. But what we've all realised is knowledge isn't enough. Um, awareness isn't enough. It's about bringing about change. And why do people change? Well, people change their behaviour 
markedly uh, extraordinary um, during the uh, lockdown. We did things we could never have imagined in terms of restrictions, staying at home, not seeing loved ones, wearing masks, social distancing. So we can change. We are actually very flexible and we can habituate very quickly. But we need to make environmental change and green change relevant to people's lives. And the reason we changed in the pandemic was because of our health. And we need to, um, when we're constructing campaigns, is think about what are people's priorities, health, family, uh, education, jobs, and, and really connect our, our message to those. One of the, probably the single biggest mistake I see in change, whether it be in organizations or community, is a lack of maintenance. And what I mean by that is we put a lot of energy to start the change process, to get people excited, motivated. We have vision boards, you know, we have big meetings, but it's actually the boring stuff that makes all the difference. It's maintaining it. The fact is the numbers show that most people don't finish their, their intended change, whether it be going to a gym, whether it be doing a diet, or whether it be recycling everything or whatever they decide to do. So we need to find ways of not just starting it, but more importantly, in many ways, maintaining the change. Yeah. It's about making it convenient. What we're learning from behavioral science, and particularly uh, the work of nudges, which you might have heard of, or the more formal term, choice architecture, which was developed by one of only two psychologists to get the Nobel Prize, uh, which uh, Richard Thaler, was we have to make it as simple and convenient and accessible. So, for example, um, where I know Jeff Barnard at, uh, with me at Green and Stenning, we're talking about how green is my street, where we compare different streets where we can see what our neighbours are doing and compare it, that makes it more likely. Another nudge is using spokes, local spokespeople who are credible and likeable. Getting people to make pledges, yes, pledges really do work. And having social proof of highlighting people who've really uh, benefited from doing this behaviour. But the two final things I want to talk about in Lessons of Change are, are the big ones, again, for me, um, along with maintenance. One is to be positive. And I'm glad a lot of people have said how important it is we have positive, inspiring stories. One of the biggest reasons why green initiatives fail is because they're too negative. And of course, the news is incredibly negative. We're in a terrible state. We know that. But the problem is, as neuroscientists have shown, that when we feel guilt, fear and anxiety, it actually closes us up. It encourages to freeze, you know, literally to feel uh, like we paralyze us almost so we can't take action, it's overwhelming. So we need to give some people something positive to move towards rather than something negative to move away from. We need an optimistic vision of what the good life could be, how life could be better for people, and to get people engaged in discussions like this, talking about positive visions of the future. And the final one uh, is an area which I specialise most in, those of you who know me, which is having a compelling story. In my group, I talked about the American group, Climate Mobilization. And um, this is a group that's been very successful, has similar aims to Seeker in some ways. They encourage uh, cities in the US to declare a climate emergency, but they go further. What they say is the whole of American society, in fact, global society, has to be on a war footing in terms of a war to save humanity, to save our planet, or certainly, um, you know, to prevent catastrophic climate change. And their message is to protect communities across the world from a climate emergency, we need a radical solution, a whole society mobilization of people and resources. And I love this idea of mobilization, of thinking how can we get every person in society involved in this? It probably isn't possible, but there is, is finding the individual motivations for groups and individuals. So I'd like to end by offering a suggestion, a, a vision, if you like, um, of where Seeker could go. You know, we're all very different groups and we have different focuses and issues, but we're united by similar values and a similar desire to prevent climate and biodiversity collapse. And we're all committed to change. So why not make Seeker a group of climate or change champions? And why don't we become experts in the change process? 
and we could become a mutual support group sharing best practices and change management where we collectively leverage our memberships, our skills, our resources, our networks and influence to help each other bring about the changes that we so desperately need. So why not become a collaborative network of change champions? Thank you very much. Wow, that's good stuff. Thanks very much, Paul. Excellent. And uh, I think that brings 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 to the end a really, really exciting morning. And what I'd like to do now is hand back to where we started with the people who started all this right a, right a, a couple of years ago. Uh, Nicola and Carrie, how would you like to end us? Well, how would we like to end? Well, I just thank you, Paul, for those last words. And I think that, you know, just following on from that, what's so important is that people can see a vision of the future. And so often that vision of the future is not there. People can't see it. The only vision that they see is an apocalyptic future. And it's for us and for our groups to actually show them and whether that's you know, a visual representation as well of just showing this is what the future can look like. And to be able you know, say, if we can't see it, we're never gonna get there. And so that's part of you know, all of our jobs is to be able to really help people to visualize the future that we actually want. And, you know, it's like what's been so amazing seeing how, you know, this plate that we started spinning of Seeker, how it's been going and continuing and continuing. But it's really important also that, you know, if there is anybody there out there listening right now that does have a little bit more time that could give to Seeker, it is so what is needed to help. Because, you know, there's a great saying that if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. And we are all by nature busy people. But if there is anybody that feels that they could just step it up a little bit more to help um, in the steering group of Seeker, then please, please, you know, come to the next steering group meeting and see how you can, you know, help us keep that plate spinning. So brilliant day and thanks all for coming and what'd you say thank you yeah thanks everybody for coming thank and thank you and thank you and thank you thank you and thank goodbye. you and thank you and goodbye and goodbye well done everybody thank you brilliant work <laughs>